open world design has become a catch-all for a variety of designs in the last decade, but it is still very much limited in what the player can and can't do in that space. And for today's Critical Thought, we're going to be discussing the concept and implementation of points of interest and what they mean when it comes to kind of structuring or laying out your open world. Open world design has become a major focal point for a lot of developers as a way of really building their game spaces out. It's been a part of everything from Just Cause 4 over there, The Witcher, Skyrim, any uh, Ubisoft game I think in the last five years, and so on and so forth. And there's this general idea that the massive space kind of makes up for or makes itself have content to it. And that's not really the case. And we, I want to talk a little bit more about essentially what points of interest are and what this means when you're framing your game. So a point of interest is essentially any kind of fixed or localized event in either an open world or a procedurally or randomly generated space. So think of it as like a very compartmentalized piece of content in your game. It could be anything and everything from finding a shop in The Buying of Isaac, a random event in, I think it was like Red Dead Redemption or Grand Theft Auto, the AI life system of something like Stalker and so on and so forth. It can be as little or as big as you can imagine. But the important thing is that points of interest are oftentimes fixed events. This is not the same as procedurally generating the world, which can create its own unique landscape. These elements are handmade parts by a developer that are used essentially as anchor points or kind of ways of building the foundation of your game. Now, points of interest in terms of design can vary again depending upon what the design needs. Now, when you're thinking about your game along these lines, what you're doing is figuring out what are all, any and every possible event that can occur within this game space. And for many AAA and larger titles, they'll go for a very small number of POIs in terms of their classification, but then just litter the entire map with them. From kind of like the stealth missions and challenges in Spider-Man, collecting, I think it was like flags or pigeons or whatever from one of the Assassin's Creed games, and you get the picture. Now, what makes this so important from a design perspective is that these points of interest are going to define what is happening in your world outside of the main events. So we're talking about an open world game. The main events are story missions. These are the kind of like uh, instance areas. For roguelikes and games built on proc gen or random gen, points of interest are a little bit more complicated than that because these are all the tools that your games engine is going to use when creating some kind of a stable or cohesive level. If you want to talk about things a little bit easier, in Spelunky, for instance, a point of interest would be finding the shop on a map, the uh, booby-trapped idols in the various temples, finding the uh, sacrificial temples. Those elements are locked. What their functionality is remains consistent. Now, you can have some random result out of a point of interest, such as, what are the stocks of a shop? Am I going to, you know, get the lucky roll or fail the event, etc.? But what the event represents and what its purpose is will remain fixed each and every time it is generated or placed in the game space. So what that means from a design perspective is that while the entire world or game space is going to be generated from scratch, these elements, again, are fixed within the space. And it's important because these are going to be the major points that define how you play through the game. And 
This is where a lot of first-time NOS developers tend to mess up. That a wide, you know, it takes 40 minutes to go from point A on the map to point B over there is content. And it's not. And this is an issue that we see from a lot of kind of open-world road-like designs. That the points of interest... Those are the aspects that actually move the story, they change what's going on, they impact the moment-to-moment -moment gameplay. When you're just wandering around, maybe one enemy shows up, maybe it starts raining, that's not changing it, and that just ends up being padding for the players. And as we're going to talk about in the next part, that you need to be very much aware of what kind of content is going to move the story forward or move the gameplay forward and what's kind of, I guess, like the filling or the padding of your game that is just going to be there to facilitate, you know, the break or the pacing between point of interest A, B, C, D, and so on. Now, like I said, Points of interest in open world or traditional AAA games is different from the points of interest in a procedurally generated space. Because again, when we talk about a traditional or AAA game, that map is fixed. It is 100% handmade. So the points of interest simply become stuff to do. And obviously the more stuff you have on your map, the better it's going to be. But if the content, because it is still fixed, is just repeating the same thing over and over again, then it's going to drive away some of your fan base who don't want to do the 30th base defend mission or the 15th race around the same looking area. Now some games have handled this better than others. People have, of course, go, gone for 100% in the Batman games. I'm sure there are a few of you who have Platinum, Marvel, Spider-Man, uh, Ghosts of Tsushima, and so on and so forth. But with that, I want to take a quick break, and when we come back, we're going to switch our footage to talk about an open-style roguelike. And now for a quick shout out to our current Game Wisdom supporters and sponsors. Going forward, all Patreon supporters will get early access to our videos. And if you'd like to continue this discussion on game design, be sure to check out our Discord channel, link down below. If you're looking for more wisdom about game design, be sure to check out my latest offering of books, 20 Essential Games to Study, aimed for first-time developers and students looking for some inspiration for their upcoming games, and Game Design Deep Dive Platformers if you're interested in anything regarding 2D and 3D platforming design. They're both available in print, digital, and wherever books are being sold. When we talk about kind of this idea of open world design and having it influenced by the points of interest or POIs, you can kind of see the pros and cons of it very quickly. And our example is of Sunless Skies by Fail Better Games. Now, Sunless Skies is a developer that kind of focuses on storytelling first, and this can definitely be seen by their POIs. Each one, such as this little homestead here and other things that show up, essentially is its own little story vignette with a beginning, middle, and end for the player to enjoy. And they will typically expand in their games or expand their titles with more POIs and more story beats with subsequent updates. Now, advanced examples of POIs can influence other ones, such as having them connected based on how you end one or moving from one area to the next. And again, the point of the POI is that it provides a foundation or an anchor to this massive open space. Now, as you've been watching for the last minute or so, you're probably starting to get this idea of a downside with it. And that is, there's not much else going on right now. See, for a lot of open-world-style roguelike games that focus on POI, POIs, what typically happens is that the game space, for the most part, is fixed in terms of its general size. 
and then the POIs are kind of sprinkled throughout. Now, in some cases, POIs may be linked to a specific area. Like, let's say the northern part of the map is an Arctic zone. So we'll have, you know, an Arctic station or some kind of cold-related POI up there. But its actual position in the world could be in, is up for grabs. So this is a way of, again, kind of having your cake and eating it too. The world has a structure to it, but it's not a 100% fixed structure. But again, as you're watching this, very little is happening in between. And this is the downside of this focus on POIs, that they become the only thing that really matters. And this can work, and we're going to switch to another example in a minute or so, but it only works when the structure is very fixed, it's very structured in that aspect. With Sun the Skies here, so much of this game is spent on the downtime of moving from point A to point B to C all the way up to Z. And it starts to wear on you. And there are people who really love these games. And again, for the fans of Fail Better, when you get hooked on them, you are going to be in for a very long time of exploring and learning about all the lore and story. But again, this hurts the moment-to-moment -moment gameplay. And one of the issues that these kinds of open structures has is that if the player doesn't know what they should be doing or where they should be going, what can end up happening is they're going to miss something very important or not know what they're supposed to do, fail, and realize, what was I supposed to do there? And this is something that Fail Betters actually had, they did work on between uh, Sunless Sea to Sunless Skies. Sunless Sea was the first one of this. And Sunless Skies is definitely better. The combat, as you're about to see, is a little bit more involved. But again, once we're done with this, we're back to wandering. And this is an issue a lot of open structure kind of games have with them. Now, some of those titles will go for emergent behavior, such as having factions and dynamic quests. But so much of the game space is just kind of there for padding. And again, it really begins to wear on somebody if they're either not interested in the story or they're just still trying to figure out what they should be doing. So very quickly, if you want to see an example of how a point of interest structure can work where it's more contained, you can turn to something like Monster Train or a node-based system. Node-based design is essentially setting up your game to be essentially a series of events. So if you're looking on the map here, each one of those little spots on either side of the rails represents a point of interest, whether it's getting money, buying items from the shop here, getting rid of cars, duplicating cars, etc, etc. Their actual functionality remains consistent from play to play. Now, where they show up or the variance of their results, that's up for grabs. So there's kind of a grab bag event that's kind of a cave that can show up in Monster Train. And when that does, I know I'm going to get some kind of event. What I don't know is exactly what that's going to be. And you can see something very similar to this kind of structure in Slay the Spire, where again, the player is given the information as to what to expect and kind of prepare for it, but they don't know exactly what is going to appear. And this is kind of the more popular example of points of interest in roguelike design, where it's a self-contained event the player knows ideally or roughly what's going to happen, but they don't 100% know the outcome of it. To some extent, again, if you click on them that says give you 50 gold, you're going to get 50 gold. But the ones that provide some level of variance or random outcomes can lead to the game being far more replayable while still keeping this rigid structure. Again, with Monster Train, pun intended, I can't go off the rails and do something that the game doesn't already plan for. But because of that structure and that framing, it allows the developers to experiment 
and make that overall experience have different outcomes so that I can play Monster Train 50, 100, 200 times, and even though the points of interest and those nodes remain the same, I'm still going to get different experiences for it. With that said, to wrap things up, points of interest are an important point when it comes to framing an open world or roguelike structure to your game. Again, these are the anchor points that are going to find the major events of your play, whether it's going to a shop, fighting a boss, finding some rare loot, and so on and so forth. And as a developer, you want to essentially come up or mark down what are going to be the POIs of your game. Because this is where you're going to be spending a lot of time balancing things out. Such as, if an event is too good that the player will never want to miss it, or if something is just too damn risky, and why should I take an event that has a 70% chance of killing my entire crew, or removing all my best cards? And when you structure your games like this, it allows you to start putting together kind of where the replayability and variance will come into play. For those of you watching this, can you think of other good or bad examples of POI design or node-based systems? Let me know in the comments below and come back for daily discussions on game design here and on game wisdom, where some of the art and science of games. Until next time, take care. Thanks for watching the video. If you enjoy things, be sure to do all the liking and subscribing that the kids are doing these days. Check out our Discord channel link down below where we hang out and chat game design and come back later tonight for our regular streamings. But that's it. And tune in for more great content here and on Game Wisdom, where we examine the art and science of games.